Good morning. If you'd do me a favor, I'd like to start by having all of us close our eyes, if you're comfortable. If you're not, that's fine too. And just take three long, slow, deep breaths with me. And at the end of that, just open your eyes back up and I'll know that, that we're finished. Okay? Three long, slow, deep breaths. Okay, I can't see everybody, so I think a couple of people fell asleep, and that's okay too. So thank you for that. What we just participated in is what the neurobiologists call shifting from one, system, one nervous system to another nervous system. We shifted from the sympathetic nervous system, which is the get up and go, to the parasympathetic system, which is they call the rest and digest nervous system. And there's different emotions that are available in those uh, different systems. And this is a way of self-regulation. And even though I asked all of you to do it, it was really for me, because I was in the sympathetic I, system and I really wanted to get into the parasympathetic system and try and handle some of these nerves that are going on standing up in front of you guys this morning. So thank you for that. Um, so, leadership and emotional competence. Mark talked about emotional literacy. And I've been working in a, the field of adult education for over 40 years. It's kind of scary for me to say that. And what I have found, and my co-author Dan Newby found, is that most everyone, including ourselves, were emotionally illiterate. And what do we mean by that? We mean that most people are unable to actually identify, name, and understand whatever emotion that they're currently in. A recent survey found that only 36% of people could do that. So that leaves almost two-thirds of us in the other category. And why does this matter? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And why does that matter to leaders? Well, let's take a look. So what do emotions have to do with leadership? And from our point of view, it's everything. Now, of course, it's not everything, but I say that because I want to highlight how important it is that I've found. Um, Matt, actually, uh, Jeff was talking about how, as leaders, we get really good at a task and then we get promoted. And that's actually what happens. The reason why we, we uh, are not emotionally literate is because we've never learned about it. How many of you had a course in grade school, high school, on emotional resonance, literacy, connection? No hands up, me either. But you did learn a lot about reading, writing, and arithmetic, which is a good thing. Because our learning is focused on the left side of this diagram, which is technical competence, which is important if you're going to be a leader, yeah? So models, processes, best practices, standards, resources. But the right side of this is emotional literacy, use of language, presence, trust, listening. How important is trust in your organization? How important is trust if you're in a jazz trio, as Matt was talking about? If you can't trust your fellow musicians to pick up when you miss and make it look seamless, that's a problem. So emotional literacy is not just something nice to have. It's as you go up the ladder, your technical competence 
becomes less and less important, at least in the experience that I've had with coaching a whole lot of people over many, many, many years. And what becomes more important is your political skills and your personal skills. Your ability to navigate the world of emotions becomes more and more and more important. If you cannot connect with another human being, it's gonna make it very difficult for you to coordinate action with them. So, but before we get into what we can do about it, so let's find out, let's define our terms. So what is an emotion or what are emotions? And Dan and I looked around and we couldn't find a definition. There's lots of definitions, but there wasn't anyone who said, this is it. And one of the reasons why that is, is because you can't see them. You can't put your hands on them. They're kind of mysterious, which is some of the myths that uh, Mark was pointing to around, around emotions. So it's really difficult to pin them down. But we came up with one that we like. So we used the Latin, okay? And for those of you that are Latin teachers or Latin scholars that actually know how to pronounce this, forgive me, I'm gonna use my best Italian version, which would be <laughs> emovere, right? To move. And so for emotion, it's the energy that moves us, which I find to be really easy to remember, first of all, emotion, the energy that moves us, and also appropriate. For in our world, it's emotions are what connect our ideas and plans to action. And we'll get into that in a little while. So emotion, the energy that moves us, or our fuel for action. And like we spoke about before, what are some myths that we need to bust up before we actually can address emotions themselves? So first off, Emotions can be avoided. Well, good luck with that. Okay? It's like, no, they can't. Our new interpretation, and I'm so grateful to Jeff for, A, asking me to present here. I was truly honored. Thank you very much uh, for asking me to be here. But also, B, for talking about how important it is to have emotional connection in life. And they cannot be avoided Right? The new interpretation, and yeah, now I remember what I was trying to say, Jeff, was thank you for offering that we all see the world differently. And so I'm offering you an interpretation of emotions. If it helps you, if it works for you, if you find it useful, fantastic. If it doesn't, find something else. But we, offer, we offered our book and this interpretation as a starting point for people to get curious about their own lives, their own emotional lives. And so, but it's just our interpretation. It's just how we're seeing it. So just try it on and see if you like it. So thanks for that, Jeff. Okay, so our new interpretation is they're non-discretionary. Every human being has emotion. And by non-discretionary, I mean it's like eating, sleeping, drinking. It's like you're always in an emotion and not just one. How many of you experience multiple emotions simultaneously? Yeah? My favorite old joke is, um, what's, the, uh, what's the definition of mixed emotions? Watching your mother-in-law drive off a cliff in, a new Mercedes, in your new Mercedes? <laughs> so, forgive me to all those mother-in-laws out there. I love you dearly. It's just a joke, okay? But, that's the definition of a mixed emotions, uh, right? So we're always in an emotion, and if we don't know what emotion we're in, we're, we're kind of hobbled a little bit in terms of coordinating action with other people. Have, how many of you have walked into a meeting room and you could just, you could cut the mood with a knife? It was like, whoa, what went on here? And not in a good way. Anybody? It's like, yeah. So that's the other thing about emotions. They're, transmittable. They're contagious. If you're in a great mood and people come around you, tendency for them is to get into a great mood too. I, used, uh, I was in a coaching course and they always liked to dance during breaks. 
And I've always had a thing about dancing, you know, it's like, mm. And so I never, but it was impossible to resist it. It was so uplifting and so joyous that I found myself dancing despite my ness. It's like, it's great how emotions can lift us and also not lift us. So, new interpretation. They're non-discretionary. Everybody has them. Second myth. Some emotions are good, other emotions are bad. Anybody live in that one? Come on. Okay, that's better. Yeah! I, there's definitely emotions that I prefer, and there's emotions that I prefer to stay away from. So what are some emotions that you like to hang around? Anybody? Happiness. Happiness. Creative. Creativity. Creative. Joyful. Joyful. Love. Sorry? Love. Love. Absolutely. And what are the ones you would <laughs> rather not? Anger. Anger. Fear. What? Fear, frustration, anxiety. Yeah. See how much easier it is to talk about the bad ones? <laughs> anyway, so rather than good or bad, it's like, are they serving us or are they not serving us? Is the emotion that I'm currently in serving us in the situation that I'm in? Or is it not? Because there's times when it's really important to be afraid. The, the anthropological biologists are telling us, and the evolutionary biologists are telling us, that our emotions were developed long, long ago to help us survive. The emotion of disgust is like, don't eat that. Right? The emotion of fear, don't be eaten by that. <laughs> right? It's like... And so these are really important parts of our makeup from, I don't know how many years ago, that we ignore at our own peril. They're informing us of what's going on so that we can move appropriately. So are they serving us or are they not serving us? If there's a saber-toothed tiger out there in the, bu in the bush, okay, I should be afraid. And I should run like heck or get up a tree. Anyway, next myth. Emotions can be controlled and, in fact, need to be controlled. Leave your emotions at home. Emotions have no place at work. You're much too emotional to be a leader. There's no way a woman could be in the White House. They're too emotional. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a big old BS. It's because, in fact, we think, oh, we're making rational decisions here. The study now shows that every decision that you've ever made has been based in an emotional context. So every time you're thinking you're being all rational and logical, take another look. It's like, it's phenomenal what studies are showing these days. And let's honor our emotions. I'm really grateful to a guy named Daniel Goleman. Anybody recognize that author? He wrote the book Emotional Intelligence. He really opened up this field in the corporate world and actually legitimized the domain of emotions. If you haven't read the book and this interests you at all, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great primer for getting your hands uh, into the emotional domain. So emotions, they can be controlled for a little bit, for a little while. Right? But they always come back bigger and stronger if you try and suppress them, my experience. Okay, so, but rather than control them, our interpretation is, they, can we identify what emotion we're in? Can we begin to understand them? And then can we navigate the emotional field in a way that supports our well-being and the well-being of the people around us, the people that we lead? One of my claims, one of our claims, is that a key skill of leadership is the ability to generate the emotional context for the task at hand. Yeah? Like, how do you do that if you can't even identify the emotions that you're in or that other people are in? And it's tricky. You can think you know what the other person's emotions are, but until you actually ask them, you want to hold off on determining exactly what you think they're in. 
So, last myth, unless I missed one on the slide and then we'll have another one. But, um, so, emotions are impossible to understand or learn about. They're random, unreliable, capricious, and can't be trusted. Can't trust those emotions, right? When in fact, well, I don't know if it's a fact. When in our interpretation, and by our I mean me and Dan, my interpretation, emotions can be identified, understood, and navigated. They have a logical structure. They're predictable reactions to experience and inform us what's going on. And when we begin to realize and look at them in this way, we go, oh, hmm, let me check this out. So they have a structure, right? So let's look at the structure. What are the key elements of an emotion? Now, again, this is our interpretation. I'm sure there's other elements, but these are the three that we find really useful. And we wrote this book. We have 150 plus emotions in this book. Now, how many people, when I said 150 emotions, went, what? Right? I know I did, right? It's like usually there's the big six, right, which you already mentioned earlier on. So it's fear, anger, joy, happiness, sadness, and disgust. But there's 150. And when you just start to explore, it's like, oh, wow, I didn't notice the difference between envy and jealousy. Oh, there's a difference? Yeah. Jealousy means I want what you have, and I want to take it away from you. Envy means I want what you have, and I'm going to figure out a way to create that in myself. Right? I admire what's going on in you. Totally different ways of acting based on those emotions. But how many times did we conflate those two? Am I jealous or am I envious? Envious is, for me, a much kinder emotional state. So the key elements of an emotion. A story. It gives us information and it has an underlying narrative. It also has an impulse. So emotions have an energy that have a tendency to move us in a certain way. And we call that a predisposition for action. One interpretation, so the impulse of anger is to punish. Right? Now, just because it has that impulse doesn't mean that I need to act in that way. It just means when I'm angry, if I'm aware of that's the impulse, then I can choose, is punishment really what I want to do here? Is this going to be the most effective way of working with this group or this person? So there are predispositions for action. And finally, every emotion has a purpose. Emotions are a legitimate domain of wisdom and learning if, we're, if we take the time, and this is what I loved about what Matt was talking about, if we take the alone time to spend with ourselves and go, what is it actually that I'm feeling right now? And why? What's the story? And is this serving me right now? I can't tell you how many people I see that are unhappy, and depressed. And what's the narrative around that? And we begin to break it down, and they can begin to take a little bit of purchase on that and begin to explore different alternatives. So I want to break down, just to give you an example, I'm going to break down a few emotions. So let's decode sadness based on what we just talked about. So the story of sadness is I've lost something that I care about. Does that make sense? Holy smokes, thank you, Maria. I have 48 seconds to finish this, and I have about five more minutes to finish it, but I'm gonna... Take the five? Okay, thanks. My apologies, I was given 20 minutes and gone over. So, the story is I've lost something that I care about, okay? And the impulse is, what do you think the impulse is when you're feeling sad? What are you inclined to do? Cry, okay. Turn inward, yeah. You're not going to go out and party. Well, maybe, but, you know, that's one way to, quote, unquote, avoid, right? Let me not pay attention to this. Let me just go out and be with people that are not sad. 
that works, that can shift your emotion, but it won't, probably won't shift the underlying narrative of what you've lost. Okay, yeah. So the impulse is to withdraw and to grieve. And the purpose is it shows me that I care about something. I wouldn't be sad if I lost it, if I didn't care about it. And then I can begin to look at, so what is the meaning here for me? So you see how they're logical, they make sense, they're there for a reason, and you can understand them, rather than this mysterious, vague realm of emotions? So let's decode joy. So the story of joy is, I want to celebrate. Right? I was, I was on a river cruise with my wife Cheryl, and um, I looked on the other side of the bank from the, from the boat that we were on, and there was a young woman, I don't know, maybe she was 10, 11, 12, girl, and she was literally jumping up and down with joy. I'd heard the expression, but I'd never seen it. Her face was lit up like this guy's, that guy's, and she was jumping up and down. It was beautiful to behold. So the impulse is, and this is where it gets really simple, the impulse is to celebrate. I, I have the predisposition, predisposition to celebrate when I'm feeling joy. And the purpose is it lets me celebrate. It's really hard to celebrate if you're not feeling at least happiness and preferably joy. The last one I just want to give an example of is decoding ambition. And the emotion of ambition is, the word ambition can be loaded with a lot of uh, characterizations, but how we like to hold it is the story of ambition is that there's lots of opportunities out there and I want to pursue them. And the impulse is to pursue possibilities. And the purpose is it shows me the possibilities, not only shows me, but also gives me the energy to pursue them. When you're in ambition, boom, you're going to go for it. Now, it brings me to two key leadership emotions that I think every leader needs to at least be competent in understanding, if not be able to generate. The first is empathy, and the second is trust. A person gave me a great definition of the difference between empathy and sympathy. Empathy is touching pain with love, and sympathy is touching pain with fear. Oh, I'm so glad that didn't happen to me. Okay, so that's a distinction that you might find useful. And trust, for me, is the key to all coordination of action. And you have to know how to build it, maintain it, and repair it as a leader because shit happens. People make mistakes. And they don't do it intentionally, but trust can be broken when that happens, and how do you repair it? So we hold trust as the story being, I'm not taking excessive risk. The impulse is to coordinate action with others. And the purpose is it lets me interact with other people or entities. It's also an assessment. It's an emotion, but it's also an assessment. And this is where, as a leader, you can determine, so what's, I don't trust this person. What's missing? So there's four sub-assessments to this, which the first is, is this person being sincere? Is what they're saying in front of my face the same as what they're saying behind my back? That's what we mean by sincerity in this place. Are they sincere? Okay, that's the hardest one for me to determine. Second is, are they competent? Can they actually do the job that I'm asking them to do? Do they have the capability and do they have the capacity? And the third is, have they got a proven track record of reliability? Can I point to, yep, they've shown up every time they said they were gonna show up. And the fourth one is, do they care? And do they care about the same things that I care about? It's very important, or at least there has to be an overlap. The, all, the other part about assessing trust is, do we share the same standards? I want to build a three-story house. No problem. I make houses out of newspapers. Mm, not going to work for me. Okay? And trusting somebody in one domain does not mean that you can trust them in another domain. So I really love you as a babysitter. You take great care of my kids. 
uh, would you mind managing my retirement portfolio? I was like, no, right? This comes back to capacity or competence, right? So let's not, let's not conflate domains and let's not conflate liking someone with trusting someone. Those are different emotions. And just because I don't trust someone, it doesn't mean that it's a moral decision or a moral judgment. You're not a bad person because I don't trust you. It's there's something missing for me here. So that's how you build it. Right? And, and how you maintain it is by having conversations, and there's somebody sitting down here that might be able to help you with having those conversations. Uh, he's got a company, I think it's called, what is it again, Jeff? Conversations, that's what it is, yeah. Okay? Having a conversation about trust and reaffirming these domains, right? And the trickiest one of all for me is how do you repair it? And it starts with an apology and forgiveness. I was listening to a podcast about Dolly Parton and her relationship with uh, her, her mentor uh, for whom she wrote the song, I Will Always Love You. And uh, she says, all there is is forgiveness. All there is is forgiveness. So to begin to repair trust, start with an apology and see if there can be a place of forgiveness. And finally, As Matt was saying earlier, how do you get competent in this? And I want to use the old vaudeville joke. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? I guess it's a really old vaudeville joke. <laughs> you get in a cab and you go to 57th and 7th. No, you practice, practice, practice. This is a skill just like any other skill. And like Matt was saying, you need alone time to practice it, but you also need other people time to practice it. So I wish you all the best in your endeavors and may your lives be filled with joy. Thank you.